Afternoon, everyone. Uh, you all able to hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, so this week's uh, tutorial, we'll be switching it up a bit and doing a bit of calculation. Um, we're actually discussing the assignment uh, this week and next week. So before we start, uh, have you all started the assignment? Uh, if some of you finished the assignment, just let me know what's your status on the assignment so far. Do you have any issues with any of the concepts involved in the assignment? Because these tutorial times are the times when you uh, let us know what is uh, what exactly you guys are having problems with so that uh, we can focus on those, those areas. So have you all uh, started the assignment? Okay, on kit, so all okay from your side. All right, cool. You've all started. Uh, where are you guys up to uh, so, uh, with respect to the calculation report? Which uh, analysis are you up to? Okay, so you guys can add the, oh, you're actually up to the assembly drawing. Okay, cool. Great. Um, so I'll just uh, recap briefly on the concepts uh, that we are having to try and understand when we attempt these kinds of assignment questions. Uh, and then I'll open the floor up to you guys to ask any questions that you might have along the way. And if you have any specific problem or specific uh, misunderstanding about any step, please let me know so that I can focus on that. All right, so just a quick recap, the critical load path, and that's what this whole assignment is pretty much about. Um, designing a component to be able to be strong enough to withstand the stresses and the forces involved when it's, uh, when it's actually working. And we understand that the critical loading path or the critical load path will be the deciding factor whether or not a design is good or bad, all right? So if we look down at this uh, object, okay, this is our, our two shafts with the key, the bolt, uh, the bolts, the flange, and this part is turning with some torque. This part is turning and we're trying to transmit that rotational motion to this member here, member two. All right. So obviously, initially, member two will resist this motion because it's not moving and this member is moving. All right. And that's what generates all the forces that are involved. This resistance to motion. This member resisting the motion of this member. Okay. Can anybody tell me the relationship between torque, force, and distance? Feel free to unmute your mic. What's the relationship between torque and force? What's the relationship? Or what's the formula to find torque? Ashtosh, what's the relationship between force and torque? 
this is a physics concept, nothing, nothing new. If you took physics in high school or even studying that relationship, they influence each other. Uh, yes, but what also influence, influences those two? Okay, you have talk is equal to force multiplied by the distance that it's being applied at, okay? So if you increase this distance, your force will decrease and your torque will stay constant. That's the relationship. So torque has an inversely proportional relationship to the distance. And vice versa. Same for force. All right. Okay. And we understand that the critical load path will go from the member that's rotating, so from our shaft to our key, and then the key will transfer that force to the hub, and the hub will transfer that to the web, and the web to the bolt, and then out the other side. Okay. So how do we know if our design is adequate? All right. We could make any of these members as thick as possible. We already given the thickness of our shaft or the diameter of our shaft. We're already given the, the standard uh, uh, width and thickness of our key. But what's stopping us from making this boss really, really big or really small? What are the deciding factors that influence our design? We have two main factors, okay? We have the factor of safety and the factor of cost. Factor of safety is basically whether or not the part can function under the stresses that it will experience without failing. If it can do that, then it satisfies the criterion of safety. The second criterion is cost. We can make something really, really big or really bulky, but if it uses so many materials, so much material, it costs more. You have more manufacturing processes. All right. Sometimes if you make something really big, you have to modify the parts that it's connected to. So you have to find that fine balance between the right amount of material and the required safety. Now, do you all understand the importance of this stress strain curve? This is a fundamental uh, concept for mechanical and civil engineers. So if you're enrolled in those courses, this is a fundamental concept that you'll be introduced uh, to first here, and you will use this all the way through your four years of studying and then straight into the field. The stress strain curve is pretty much the, the bones of mechanical and civil engineering. So our stress strain curve is broken up into uh, three sections, basically. We have this region, which is called the elastic region. Then we have a small region, which is the elastoplastic. And then we have this region, which is the plastic region. Okay. And all materials pretty much have an elastic region. Elastic region meaning when you apply a force within this region or, and, or the object experiences a stress within this, uh, within a limit, when you release that uh, stress, it'll return to its original shape. That's called elastic deformation or the elastic region of a stress strain curve. Then you have a region called the elastoplastic, which we won't uh, really go dive into too deep in the, at this 100 level or 200 level. Uh, so at this stage, we usually call this, this whole thing, the plastic region from here to here, plastic. Okay. Now in the plastic region, once your stress reaches a critical level, the object cannot return to its original shape. It starts to deform and that's called permanent deformation or plastic deformation. And in most cases, we consider that a failure. If an object starts to plastically deform, meaning it, uh, it deforms and it cannot return to its original shape, 
we consider that a failure. And the point at which we decide whether or not a material starts to yield or not, yield is when it starts to uh, deform plastically, is called the yield stress. And that is usually our criterion, our stress criterion. It's usually called the yield stress. So when we design things, and especially for this assignment, we're designing it so that any stress that is experienced, it will always be less than the yield strength of the material or the yield stress of the material. Understood? I'm just going to re uh, recap the basic concepts just to make sure you guys uh, fully understand everything. You know, the calculation side might be easy. You might be able to cram the formula or whatnot, but actually understanding why we have those formulas and what it means is very important. Now, are there any questions up to this point? Ultimate strength here is basically the total amount of stress that the object can absorb. After this point, you can't put any more stress. You can't apply any more force. It'll just start to neck, which means it'll start to uh, basically lose all of its uh, material properties, mechanical properties. And then at this point, it'll break or fail or shear or crack or whatever you call it. We never design to the ultimate tensile strength. We always try and design to the yield strength. All right. So can anybody tell me the three types of forces that you're most likely to experience? Uh, Koshi, can you tell me the three types of forces that you can experience, <clears throat> that an object can experience? Friction, uh, friction force, uh, yes. But in this case, in this assignment, will we be experiencing any frictional force? Do you think? Tensile. Tensile? Yes, tensile is one. Tensile force. Stress, strain, tensile. Okay, so stress and strain can either be in both tensile or compressive. Stress strain are, are reactions, but they're not the force. So you have tensile force, which is one. You have tensile, compressive, and shear forces. Those are the three types of forces we usually deal with. All right. Tensile forces are forces that are perpendicular to the surface. So in this case here, this is the surface. The force is acting perpendicular, so it's 90 degrees, and it's pulling the object. So that's a tensile force. Compressive force is the opposite. It's actually pushing the object or squashing it together. And the shear force is when you have your surface and the, the force is acting parallel to that surface, and it's causing it to slide or to slice. You know, imagine that this is slicing this direction. So this is the direction of the shear force pushing against the object, pushing against the surface. Okay, so those are the three types of forces and each of those forces generates a stress. Tensile stress, compressive stress, and shear stress. And these material properties or materials each have a set amount of tensile stress, compressive stress, and shear stress that they can uh, withstand before they fail or before they yield. And understanding that, you'll be able to then uh, break down the information given in the tables or in data sheets to apply to your specific case that you're trying to design for. All right. So now let's look at our assignment. Okay, you're all able to see my screen? All able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. And hopefully you've all had a look at this uh, already and you already know what 
So important information we're going to try and extract. Firstly, you read through this and it says we have to produce 3,000 units per year. When you hear that, you should automatically know this is not a one-off thing. Okay, there's a lot of money that's being invested into this. So it's very important that we do a calculation analysis beforehand to make sure that our design is actually feasible before we go into production. So by the client stating that they want to make 3000 units per year, that means the client is investing a lot of money and they want to make sure that their product works. That is the purpose of doing a calculation report. All right. And the client is given certain uh, specifications or requirements that it has to be able to uh, withstand. So when it's working, it must be able to transmit 75 kilowatts and it'll revolve 25 seconds, uh, 25 times per second. And the shaft has a nominal diameter of 48 millimeters. All right. So straight off the bat, we are given our power. We're given our revolution, so N. 25 revolutions per second. And we are given our shaft diameter, 48 millimeters. The flanges can be made of cast iron and keyed to the shafts. The power is transmitted from one flange to the other by a circle of fitted bolts. Let's comply to technical specifications. Okay, so the flange or the coupling this coupling has to be made of cast iron. All right, so you would look into the material properties of cast iron, specifically its uh, compressive strength, its tensile strength, and its shear strength. All right? And we are told that it has to be connected via bolts, and we're given the bolts that it has to be able to use. So class property for 4.6. Uh, nominal size can be anywhere between five to 100. Uh, the material that's being used, and we're given the ultimate tensile strength as well as the tensile yield strength. All very important parameters to define. And what we have to do is we basically have to divine, design the coupling to be able to withstand these forces that will be exerted, right? So first step, is our torque analysis. Can anybody tell me how we would find torque given the information that we've been given? We are given the formula. Power is equal to two pi n t over 60. Yes? This is the conversion from torque to power. We know our power and we know our revolutions. This is RPM, so this is revolutions per minute. We need to find out torque. So we have 75,000, two pi n, and yes, we make T the subject. Thank you. Two by N, our N is 25 revolutions per second. We have to make that revolutions per minute. So 60 seconds in a minute, multiplied by our torque, divided by 60. We can cancel these 60s and make T the subject of the formula. And we end up with 477.46 Newton meters. That's the step one. We have to find the force that is being applied. Force in this case is the torque that's being applied. Any questions up to here? All right, we're just trying to find out the torque. And as I said, the torque will be constant, okay? We're trying to transmit the same power. 
power in this case is the torque. So we're trying to transmit the same torque. So torque will be constant for all, but the force experienced on each part will be different because the distance from the center will be slightly different at each point, okay? You get what I mean? So the force will vary. So as we increase our distance away from the center of the shaft, so as the distance increases, our force will be expected to decrease in order for this T to remain constant. Okay. So the first analysis we do is the key analysis. Let's look at the force that will be exerted on this key. When this part is rotating, what direction will the force be acting in? The force will be trying to stop that motion. This part is rotating this way, the force will be acting in the opposite direction, trying to stop it from rotating. All right. So first we have to decide, determine how much that force is. So torque is equal to force times distance. Torque in this case again is 47.46. Force is unknown and our distance is what? What's our distance? From the center of this shaft to where the force is being applied, what's our distance? It's our radius of our shaft. So 24 millimeters. And from there, we can find our force. All right. We're assuming that this key, half of it is inside the shaft or inside the keyway, and half of it will be protruding and will be used into the locking mechanism of the coupling, okay? So we're assuming half will be embedded inside the shaft and half will be uh, protruding, used in the locking mechanism. And the force will be experienced on half that key height. So exactly at the point 24 millimeters from the center of the shaft. Right, once we have our force, we can go about trying to find our key length. And the key length is the most important thing that we're trying to find out here. Now, what type of force is this? What's this type of force? Can anybody tell me? Is it tensile, compressive, or shear force? Shear force. And why do you say that, Shivnil? It's a shear force because it is acting parallel to the surface. Okay, this force is trying to slice this key in half, not pull or push it, it's trying to slice through it. So that's a shear force. So we're going to use the shear stress. Well, the shear stress of the key is equal to the force on the key divided by the area of the key. And in this case, the area of the key is equal to the width of the key. We're trying to find this area, remember, this rectangle. Area of the key multiplied by the length of the key, which is what we're trying to find. And if we rearrange this formula, we'll find the length of the key is equal to the force of the key, force on the key divided by the shear stress of the key, shear stress of the material that the key is made of multiplied by the width of the key. Okay. Now, the shear stress of the key or the shear strength of the key, we can take from, from here. Okay, we're assuming that the key is made of steel, mild steel, 
and it has a shear strength of 28 megapascals. So in this case, this is now 28 megapascals or mega Newton meter squared. And mega is times 10 to the power of six. Remember to always try and convert things into the SI unit. So what's the SI unit for length? Now, uh, Josefa, what's the SI unit for length? Meters, yes. And for force? Newtons. Okay, good, good. Okay, and for stress? How about stress? Cool. Newton per meter squared. Yes, okay. So make sure you convert everything into your SI units before you start calculating. From here, we can find our length. Now, if we run the calculation, we'll come to a length of about 50.8 mm or something like that, yeah? And now you have to now apply your logic. If we were to try and make a key, since this is a standard part and there'll be 3000 of these made, does it make sense for you to make a very specific dimension like 51 millimeters or 50 millimeters? Because obviously you'd have to round this value either up or down. We can't round it down because if we round it down, it won't be able to satisfy the shear stress criterion. You know, if we round this down, we put 50, our, our stress will actually be a, bit, a little bit higher than the amount that it's able to take. So if we make it a little bit longer, we start to factor in a factor of safety. So if we round this up, it'll become safer. If we make this longer, it'll become safer. So it'll come to about 51 millimeters. Now, to you, does that make sense for you to have a part that is 51 millimeters? You give this to the manufacturing guys and they have to cut the billet into 51 millimeters. That's a very specific number. So yes, as discussed by Dr. Kabir, you can either round it up to 55, which is more of a standard, uh, and at a dividend or like something that is more like more likely for a manufacturer to be able to produce. Or you could even go up to 60 millimeters if you so wished. Okay. The bigger you make it, the more safe it is. But also you have to remember that at a certain point, you're starting to just waste material. So you can either take 55 or 60, whichever one you want. And there is no wrong answer here. You can, if you make the assumption that you want to use 60, you use 60. Use 55, use 55, but it has to be more than 51. All right, so that is the key analysis. I'll take a look at the hub analysis. And from the hub analysis, what are we trying to find? What's the most important feature we're trying to find? We're trying to find this thickness, this distance between the top of where the key is to the very edge of the hub. Why? Because that is the load path, the critical load path. The load will pass through here. It is the thinnest bit of material. Obviously over here is thinner than over here. So if it's going to fail, it's going to fail where the material is very thin. So obviously here, and we have to try and find what's the minimum thickness or the best thickness that we can use so that this part won't fail or won't crack. All right. So what type of force are we experiencing here? Remember our part is turning this way, this part is trying to resist it. So the force is acting this direction. So what type of force are we looking at here? A tensile force, yes. Yes, we're looking at a tensile force. All right, sometimes people can be confused whether it's a tensile or compressive. Just bear in mind, okay? 
sorry, the force is actually acting this direction. If our part is rotating this way, the force is almost pulling the part apart. It's pulling it apart, causing it to crack, pull apart. So this is a tensile force. Which means we'll have a tensile stress. <clears throat> Okay, so we still have our torque. We need to find our force. Do we know our radius or our distance? Now, how many of you have put this distance as, uh, obviously we'll have our radius first of our shaft, so 24 multiplied by this amount of the key that's protruding from the top. So that is our key thickness. So key thickness divided by two. Sorry, this is plus, not minus, times. And then we plus some, some random amount, some, some assumed thickness. Assumed thickness divided by two. Why? Because we're saying that the force is going to be acting at the center of that thickness. So thickness divided by two. So what thickness have you guys used? Okay, it's an assumption. So completely up to you guys. What thickness have you guys used? Or have you assumed to do your calculation? Used eight millimeters, but didn't divide. Okay, 4.57, all right. Uh, let me show you a, okay, you're able to see my screen, Excel sheet. Yes? So I've made an Excel sheet just to show the different types of calculations that you could do at this point without having to actually do it by hand. Okay, we know our torque and our torque is constant. We are going to apply any kind of thickness that we would like to, that we assume that the material will be. And the uh, Excel sheet will calculate the force and the resulting hub thickness that the hub should be. Now in Dr. Kabir's examples in the lectures, he used a total thickness of 13 millimeters or 0 0.013 meters. And he got a hub thickness of 0 0.031 or 31 millimeters. All right. Now for you guys, so, so Shivnil, you used the thickness of 4.5. So is that half thickness or full thickness? Let's say that's half. Okay. So then your full thickness will be nine millimeters. You get a hub thickness of 0 0.32. Now notice if I put a assumed thickness of 0 0.026, so 26 millimeters is my assumed thickness. Notice that the hub thickness that it uh, calculates for is almost the same, right? Meaning my factor of safety is almost one. And basically what this uh, assignment is saying it says to do keep doing iterations of the same calculation to find out the best possible thickness. What it's saying is at 26 millimeters, you have a factor of safety of one, which means 26 millimeters is the minimum thickness that your hub can be. So if you were then to choose a thickness of uh, say 31, which is what was calculated in the lecture examples, you start to get a factor of safety of 0 0.25, oh, sorry, no, 1.25. So this is where you start to see the importance of your factor of safety. Now let's go back to uh, our question. All right. 
thickness are we going to use? And if we go up here, we see the table where it starts talking about factors of safety, which is here. What it says is a factor of safety of 1.25 to 1.5 is for exceptionally reliable materials under controllable conditions. So we know the types of conditions or the types of forces that we're going to be experiencing. And we know the materials that are going to be used and we know that the material properties are somewhat accurate. So we would use these types of factors of safety between 1.25 and 1.5. And if you see from our calculation, and running different uh, iterations of the same calculation, if we have a thickness of 0 0.031 meters or 31 millimeters, we get a factor of safety of 1.25, which is within that threshold, within that limit that has been set by the standard, industry standard. Of course, you could increase this and go 0 0.032, and you get an even higher factor of safety and you make your material more, uh, more safe. But bear in mind, the more material you add into this, uh, into this part, the more it'll cost. So by keeping your thickness at around 0 0.031 or 31 millimeters, we have a factor of safety that is within the, the safety criteria or the, the required safety for such parts, as well as not using too much material. So this is a, bit, a delicate balance, a, a really good balance. Of course, for your own assignments, you could make this thickness whatever you'd like anything more than 26 millimeters. But then you have to draw the line at where is it just starting to waste material and where is it necessary? Okay, guys, uh, this session will end in less than a minute. So I will end the session now, but use the same login to join my next session, which I'll start uh, right away, okay? Just use the same login, the same uh, meeting and password to join the next session, second half of this tutorial.